do you ever wonder how medicines work in space? <laughs> I do. <laughs> and maybe not many other people do. Uh, so we know that going to the spaceflight environment changes a lot of aspects of human physiology. What we don't know is if those changes in physiology change how the medications we take work. And that's what I'm studying. And now that NASA is planning for uh, long duration exploration kinds of missions, like maybe going all the way to Mars, I have another thing to think about. How would we enable a healthcare system on a little spacecraft for the astronauts to use on a long voyage? The craft that they're talking about using is not large. And we need to put an entire healthcare system in there. All of the uh, medical instruments and all the medical tests you might need to run and all the medicines, everything needs to fit inside this space. And the people who are in the space need to know how to use it right. My part of this question is, is what medications do we carry? What do we need to pack? What might they need? How do you anticipate the needs of four or five people for three years? How do we fit all of that stuff into this little space? How do you handle um, things aging? So as medicines age or get used up, what do we do about that? These are the kinds of things I'm thinking about. And uh, factoring in the spaceflight environment just adds more complications. So that environment is, uh, is trying to kill you, right? Um, there's, there's, uh, there's reduced gravity. Um, it's not zero gravity the way that you hear people say. It's, it's microgravity, NASA calls it. And this uh, changes a lot of things about how human physiology works. There's also elevated exposure to radiation. And this radiation comes from solar flares and from cosmic rays. We're exposed to it here on Earth, but we're shielded a bit by Earth. Uh, when we leave Earth's protection, we're much more vulnerable to this radiation. Um, and that's, that's a big factor. But as long as human beings are, have been going to space, we've been learning about how we adapt in this environment. And we've learned how to do a few things. So in uh, the absence of gravity, our bones change. Uh, when we're in 1G now, we are, our bodies are constantly fighting the Earth's gravitational pull. And we have learned that in space, bones weaken. They become uh, thinner. And we figured out that a lot of exercise and good diet will really reduce that loss of bone mineral density. So this is what our astronauts do on the space station now. We also figured out through some uh, elegant research that an osteoporosis drug can be used to maintain bone health in space. And that's a medicine that I think we want to take to Mars. That would be a good idea. We also, when we go into a microgravity environment, we can't tell, our bodies can't tell down from up anymore. And that's because there really is no down, right? Without gravity, there's no down, which is a little disorienting to us. And most people get uh, a few days worth of space motion sickness. People may be dizzy, disoriented, maybe even nauseous, just for one or two days. It tends to go away pretty quickly. And there are medications to treat the symptoms. We should probably take some of those medications with us to Mars. To, uh, to protect ourselves from the radiation that we would be exposed to in an exploration kind of mission, you've probably seen this in science fiction books and movies, and maybe even from actual science. But there are plans in place to, uh, to go underground when we land on any significant body like Mars. Or even if we don't go underground, we could uh, make bricks or something to build a shelter that would protect us from radiation. That still leaves us vulnerable to, uh, to radiation during transit time, though. And on these Mars missions, that transit time is going to be significant. Nobody wants to uh, be doing a job that could give them cancer down the road, um, even if it's an awesome job like being an astronaut. So we want to prevent radiation-induced health effects, even if they're long-term health effects. Now, there are some organisms on Earth that are more resistant to radiation than we are. You probably heard jokes about cockroaches surviving atomic bombs. There are also tardigrades, uh, water bears, 
that are resistant to nearly every stressor we can imagine, and they, they withstand a tremendous amount of radiation just fine. We're studying these organisms to try and figure out what their adaptations are that allow them to be so resilient in the face of stressors like radiation. And I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping that we can develop a treatment that we could use, a medication for us to help us uh, be either protected from radiation damage or help repair any damage that might occur. So if we can invent that kind of medicine, I want to take that along. Now, I've just listed a whole bunch of medications I want to take on this trip, and I want to reiterate that um, I can't take everything I want to take, right? It's a very limited space that we're going to put people in. There's just not much cargo room. And that's an important feature to uh, consider. Plus, in the case of medications, they expire over time. You've seen the expiration date on your medicines, and you've probably all ignored them, right? We all do that. Um, and I'd like to tell you to stop doing that. Um, medications do degrade. It's not just a marketing ploy. Some medications degrade in a fashion where they become toxic over time. They become poisonous. Others degrade in a fashion where they become less effective. Neither one of those scenarios is good, right? Um, I want the medications that we send on our Mars missions to be safe and effective for the entire duration of the journey, all the way there, all the way back. And this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. I don't have answers yet, but I'm working on it. This is one way that I work on it. So when I'm, when I'm thinking about planning for space exploration, I think selfishly a little bit. I put myself in the astronaut's shoes. You know, how would I pack? What would I need? How am I going to use the things we take? And I am different from 89% of the astronauts who've ever been to space. I'm a female. Only 11% of the astronauts from all the countries of the world who've ever been to space have been women. Now, does a woman astronaut have to prepare for her space flight any differently than a man? Not really. They all get the same training, uh, they're all doing the same job, there's really not much that's different. But as any woman knows, if you're going to go on a trip, if you're going to be traveling, and there's not going to be a drugstore handy, you need to pack any feminine hygiene supplies that you might need. And if there's no drugstore there, you need to pack enough to last for the duration of your journey. So, so imagine a box of tampons or pads and extrapolate for 30 to 36 months. Cargo room, remember that's a problem. So this might not be the best solution. It might be convenient to, to uh, suppress menstruation, to suppress periods, and we can do that. We can do that with a, a regime of oral contraceptive use where you take the pills continuously. Now I went back to pills. Pills themselves have mass, and you have to take enough to last the entire journey, and they have an expiration date. So these pills might not be the best solution either. There are long-acting reversible contraceptives available that don't take up cargo space and last for years. Mirena is an intrauterine system. Uh, Nexplanon is implants that goes in the arm. These things suppress periods in an awful lot of women who use them. Not everyone, but a lot. And because they uh, don't take up cargo space and they last a long time, they might be a really good solution. And I've been working recently with a gynecologist to evaluate the disadvantages and advantages of these different methods of menstrual suppression uh, for female astronauts with their particular lifestyle and needs in mind. So we've been able to share that information with them. Uh, but ultimately, of course, um, how a woman chooses to handle her periods is, is a really personal choice, and it's, it's hers to decide. Even if her job is being an astronaut, she gets to decide. So we're thinking about all these, these, uh, these things that we want to have prepared for a healthcare system inside a little tiny space capsule that's going to go a long ways, a long distance for years at a time, and part of my job is to make sure that the individuals doing this have a good healthcare system. It's going to work for them for that whole journey. And I want them to be well prepared and well cared for. I want them to do this exploration for all of us, right? For all of us. Thank you. Thank you.